go before the Lord. Father God, we just come to you, Lord. We pray that you meet us here. God, that you bless our time as we uh, just set our eyes on you, God. Lord, we want to uh, um, just be able to connect. So uh, we'll just pray your blessing, your anointing on our time, Lord. Open our hearts, open our minds, wash away all the all the stuff from the day and be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.
God, we just lift this time to you and pray that you would bless it. Lord, that you would uh, open our eyes. Lord, Lord, help us to see you. Help us to feel your presence, Lord God, as we put our attention to your word. Lord, I pray that you be glorified and magnified as we seek your face. Therein, Lord, be, uh, be lifted up in this place, Lord. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. guys we're gonna be almost it's almost over <laughs> jeremiah is almost complete we are going to be in chapter 49 tonight uh next time we'll do 50 and then 51 and then we'll go on to lamentations so it will get sadder before it gets happier uh but isn't it funny? Yeah, I was going to say, isn't it funny how much that mirrors regular life? Uh, the, the, uh, our own struggles and our own issues. Tonight, we're finding ourselves at the end of a section in Jeremiah called the Oracles Against the Nations. All the major prophets have the Oracles Against the Nations somewhere in, the, in their books where they lay out God's word. Um, through the prophet to the nations. It's interesting because Jeremiah, let's see if I can remember where I hid that at. Jeremiah, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 25, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah and he gave him a charge. In Jeremiah 25 verse 15 it says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. And they shall drink it and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So Jeremiah says, I took the cup from the hand, uh, from the Lord's hand, which by the way means he was where? Can't take a cup out of a hand that's not there, can you? And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Interesting, no? And Jeremiah took the cup from his hand. John 1, in the beginning was the... The word was with God. The word was God. Very interesting. He said, I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations where the Lord sent me to drink it. So when we look at the oracle against the nations, that's the, those are the words that Jeremiah would have delivered. And he would have brought those that message to all the nations. And when we look at it, sometimes when we go through the Old Testament, it's important for us to not lose sight of the full picture, what's going on. We, I know we go chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and it's, it's easy to zoom in on the microscopic and leave behind the big picture, right? We're just looking at a tiny part of what's going on. But we, we got to keep in mind that the Bible lays out for us a story, right? The fall of man, Genesis 1 through 11. Man's corruption and man's rebellion is part of that fall. Then God looking at the nations and saying, I'm going to draw my own peculiar people, right? And so he said to Abraham, come to a land that I will show you, right? And so Abraham follows the word of the Lord. I would, I would even say that he saw the word of the Lord. Obviously, Jesus said that. Abraham saw my day and rejoiced for it. So the Lord calls Abraham out. Abraham goes. God builds the light through the nation of Israel, right? So he develops a people through whom he's going to bring the seed that will bless the whole earth. So the whole world is in rebellion and a fallen place. And so God begins the process of bringing Messiah to redeem man. And I know when we look at the Bible, we just see the picture of the story of Israel, right? Because that's what he's telling us. He's telling us the story of God's redemption of man. Please understand that the Bible does not tell you everything God did since the creation of the earth. I know that because I meet characters in the Bible and I don't know where they came from. 
right? You get to the book of Exodus and you run into a fellow named Jethro, who's the father-in-law to Moses, who is a priest of the Most High God. How did he come to know God? I don't know, but I know he was a priest of the Most High God, right? Genesis, we run into another fellow. His name's Melchizedek. Melchizedek comes out of of uh, Jerusalem, out of Salem. He's the king of Salem. He meets Abraham on his way back from the battle of the five kings, and guess what he is? He's a priest of God Most High. And later on in Hebrews, we're told that's the priesthood that Christ is in, right? It's important that we understand that there's only a, re the only way there's a new priest is if the old priest dies. Jesus died once, that's it. He'll never die again. So there'll never be another priest. There's just one. What's his name? Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek. But I go, how did Mel where did he come from? How did Melchizedek meet the Lord? How did God reveal himself to him? We don't know that, right? We're told the one story. We're following the path from the fall of man, the destruction of, of uh, um, mankind ultimately, leading to God's redemption, and the redemption story, bringing Messiah, bringing salvation, teaching the nations, bringing all those things out. And a part of that message that God gives is not only redemption, but judgment, right? That's the flip side. We all know that's real. Most of us as adults, that sometimes when we're kids, we dream that there's no such thing, right? Until we do something wrong. You ever had to stand before the judge? Yeah, I, I hope you never do. It's not any fun. <clears throat> Nobody likes it. Everything, your, for a, at least a moment, your future is in the hands of someone looking at you, judging you by your actions. And, uh, and just in my limited experience, in my immoral days, I know that I don't want to stand before a judge like that. And the Bible tells us that it is appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. So the story of God's redemption also carries the concept of God's wrath. They're, they're, that's an inseparable part of God's character. God's wrath will destroy wickedness. There's several stories about that in the Bible. I know a lot of people like to get into the prophetic nuts and bolts of Gog and Magog. And look at every time I, I turn on Facebook, there's a story about how Gog and Magog is happening. Look at how these nations are moving and these things are happening. Listen, I want you to understand the story of Gog and Magog. So you're not looking for this battle to take place. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. The story of Gog and Magog is that God will destroy evil. You hear it in, in Ezekiel, you read it in Revelation 19, and just in case you didn't understand in Revelation 19, you know what happens in Revelation 20? Same thing, Gog and Magog, same terms, same names. The, the, uh, the people, the Essenes had a story. Uh, some people think that the Essenes is where John the Baptist came from. The Essenes had a story about the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And there was this battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness all throughout time until the day when the king would return. And when the king would return, he would once and for all banish the sons of darkness. That doesn't sound familiar. There will be a day. I long for it. I look for it. I'm okay whenever the Lord wants to you know, get all those things started. What His clock's not my clock. But in the meantime, I also know that there's things that his faithful people need to be about when judgment is coming, right? When judgment comes, the, his people, the goal of God's people is not to store up as much bread as they can unless they're doing it to store up as much bread as they can to feed the people who don't have any bread. Nowhere in the Bible does God say, make sure you take care of yourself and leave everybody else on their own. You're not going to find that. Jesus' words were pretty different from that, weren't they? Yeah, if somebody asked for your cloak, did he say, if you have an extra one, give him yours? What did he say? If he asked, yeah, if he says, give you your, give you, he wants your shirt, give him your cloak also. 
He bids you, he forces you to walk with him one mile. What did Jesus say? Go with him two. You guys all know the verses. Yeah? So we recognize that there's something for God's faithful people to do. And so when we read the story of the Bible and we get into places like we're at now where we're going through the prophets and we hear a lot of the judgment, 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 that should ignite us to say that day's coming, judgment is coming. Well, In our nation, we may be in it now. But the point is, whether we are or whether we're not, we still have a job to do. Right? Rescue those who are perishing. That was the message that the prophet delivered to the people. Rescue the perishing. Now, the perishing don't always want rescued. Agreed? But it's okay. We do what we can, right? We, we do what we can. We reach out. We try to accomplish the things that we can so that you may, as Paul said, win some, right? Win some. So we begin tonight against the Ammonites. Now, <clears throat> several of these nations that we're going to look at are cousins of Israel. The Ammonites are, are sort of the, the uh, relatives you don't want to claim. You guys have any of those? So you remember Lot. Lot, it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. When Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed, the angel has to drag Lot and his two daughters out of Sodom and Gomorrah, they ask if they could go to one of the little cities. The angels finally say, fine, we'll, we'll let you go to one of the little cities. We won't destroy that city. But they're so freaked out by the whole thing, they go into a cave. Lot decides to get super drunk, and his two daughters decide it's the end of the world, and we haven't had any kids yet. So they make a plot. You lay with dad tonight, I'll lay with dad tomorrow night so we can continue the human race. You have had two children. From them came the Moabites and the Ammonites. So when we look at the Ammonites, the word to the Ammonites, there is, it's like one of the things I guess I like about the Bible is the huge dysfunctional human population. It's never off the page. Doesn't matter where you go. We dream up the concept of religious purity. On the pages of the Bible, we have reality. All the messy stuff nobody likes to talk about. So in verse 1, it says, Concerning the Ammonites, thus says the Lord, Has Israel no sons? Has he no heir? Then why has Milcom dispossessed Gad and the people settled in its cities? Milcom, Milcom, I don't know how many of you know, Milcom goes by another name. Milcom is a false deity, a uh, little g god. Milcom also goes by the term Molech. You remember Molech? So Molech was the god of the Ammonites. Molech was also a god that Israel worshipped, false god they worshipped. Uh, he was not Yahweh. He has no power. He can't stand before Yahweh. The Ammonites we see worship Milcom. So what happened? Gad is destroyed. Gad is dispossessed, right? The Babylonians, we, right? The, the tribe of Gad is no longer in their home. And Molech, the people of Molech, have moved in. And so the Lord says, does Israel have no sons? There's a remnant. Israel's going to come back. The Lord is saying to Ammon, why, why are you moving into to Israel? Oh, you think... You got to pass. You thought judgment that begins in the house of God stops there. Uh, that's not how it works. So he goes on, verse 2. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will cause the battle cry to be heard against Rabbah of the Ammonites. It shall become a desolate mound. Its villages will be burned with fire. Then Israel shall dispossess those who dispossessed him. So the land that they've taken is going to go back to Israel. Uh, Wail, O Heshbon, for Ai is laid waste. Cry out, O daughters of Rabbah. Put on sackcloth, lament, run to and fro among the hedges. For Milcom shall go into exile with his priests and his officials. Now this was typical. When another nation was conquered and the people are led in chains back to 
the parades that they would walk through when they go back under captivity. They become slaves for those people. When they would go, their gods would go before them. So the idols out of the temples would be cleared out. Obviously, the vanquished would go in and set up their stuff, right? And they would take out yours and those, those golden idols or, you know, that would become, that get melted down and become something for the people who conquered you. But your gods would be in front of you and then you would go. The only people that doesn't happen to is Israel. Because there's no graven image for Yahweh. So Yahweh said, you shall have no graven images. I don't want people to start thinking that somehow I don't have the power to give people victory. So he never marches in front of the nations. But he says here, Milcom, Molech will, they're going to be carrying the idols, the same idols they sacrificed their children to, is going to be going in front of them as they go into captivity. And the Lord is declaring it. He says its priests and its officials will go in behind Milcom. So why do you boast of your valleys? There was this idea that they had this security in their geographical positioning. In the ancient world, places like um, Petra, for example, would say, oh, you, you can't get us. You got to come through a narrow seek to get to us. We could defend that narrow seek with a child throwing rocks at you. So the geography of the area is protecting us. Now, if they lived on a high mountain or they lived in a deep valley, and so the, the way into the valley was, was guarded, it could be defended, they said, hey, we're, we're, we're able to cover all of these things. If you remember, there was a battle the children of Israel fought, and um, I can't remember who it was with. One of you guys can clear it up for me later. But uh, they have this battle, and the kings lost. And I don't remember. It was either They were either on the mountain or the valley. And they said, oh, well, Yahweh is the God of the mountains. So next time we'll fight him in the valley. And God said, yeah, I'm the God of the mountains, the valleys, and everywhere in between. There's no place you're going to go that you're going to get the victory. But this was how they looked at themselves geographically. And so when we look at Ammon, we see... Uh, or the Ammonites, we see this same attitude. Why do you boast in your valleys? Uh, o faithless daughter who trusted in her treasures. So what was the issue? And how, what does God call her? O faithless daughter. So it's not, sometimes we get the same views. We can be guilty of having the same view of the nations as the Jews did. Like their fodder for hell. But that was never necessarily God's view. It was not that God wouldn't bring uh, justice, right? There, payday someday, yes. Um, but the, the idea that, that he's laying out, oh, faithless daughter, he's saying, you trusted in all your stuff. You know anybody else like that? You trusted in all your stuff. You trusted in your plans. You trusted in your wealth. You trusted in your geography. You trusted in the power of your army. All of those things, God says, that's all lame. None of those things are going to save you. That's not, that, that does not, there's, there's no security in those places, right? And so he, he goes on. He says, okay, so everyone will be driven out. He says, behold, I will bring terror upon you, declares the Lord of hosts, from all who are around you, and you will be driven out, every man straight before him with none to gather the fugitives. So nobody's going to care about the slow or the ones that are behind. They're all just going to be driven forth. Now, when we talk about the Ammonites and we talk about Rabbah, uh, sometimes it's helpful to kind of nail down that geography. So most people, most guys will put the Ammonites and the capital of the Ammonites, Rabbah, Ammon, to be modern-day Ammon in Jordan. So that's the area, roughly geographically, that the Ammonites uh, dwelt. But listen to verse 6. Look, listen to what the Lord says. It was not just Israel. Afterward, I will restore the fortunes of the Ammonites, declares the Lord. Interesting, no? 
it's it's interesting to me that when we come to the book of Revelation, right, and we see the the throng of the people of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it is an innumerable host of people from every tribe, nation, and tongue, right? All of them gathered before the king. Here the Lord says, yeah, I'm going to bring judgment on Ammon. And, and the Ammonites had a weird family history, right? Nobody's like excited to talk about, well, how'd your family start? They didn't ever want to, they skipped those games when they all got together. They didn't want to talk about it. But the Lord says, I'm going to restore your fortunes. And I think when the Lord, ultimately, I think when the Lord's talking like that to the nations, he's talking about redemption of mankind and the promise that we see of people being saved from every nation. People from every tribe, nation, and tongue. So the Lord makes this promise. Now, we know that the Ammonites came back after the Babylonian captivity because during uh, the Maccabean revolt, uh, we can read about it in the book of Maccabees, in Maccabees, 1 Maccabees 5, 6, and 7, uh, talking about Judas Maccabeus. It says, uh, then he crossed over to attack the Ammonites where he found a strong band with many people. And Timothy was their leader and he engaged in many battles with them. And they were crushed before him. He struck them down. So the Ammonites came back as a nation after this and were restored in the land and were still a thorn in the side of Israel uh, for many years afterward. So we see uh, the promise of God being fulfilled. Now next we turn our attention to Edom, verse 7, concerning Edom. Now Edom is Esau. Esau is Edom. This is his people, the people that came as a result of, uh, of Esau. Uh, the Edomites, Edom is a play on words. Uh, it sounds like uh, um, the word for red stew. We know Esau really liked his lentil soup, right? And so, um, but anyways, this became a, a, a title for his people. And they were all the time, a thorn in the side of Israel. And they would rejoice, you know, because they'd rejoice when Israel was judged and they'd mourn when Israel was, was exalted. And so uh, God has a, a word for Edom. It says, concerning Edom, thus says the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Timon? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom vanished? So one of the things that Edom was known for was their wisdom. Now, the reason they're known for that is because they said they were wise. You know people like that? Who are uh, just um, marvels in their own eyes, right? Oh, you're so wise. Ah, I'll introduce you to one. In the book of Job, Job has a friend, uh, Eliphaz, Eliphaz, something like that. He is from, uh, from Teman. He's a Temanite. And he boasts in the wisdom that he has to give to Job. One of the things we know about Job's friends is that sometimes some of their wisdom was lacking. But here the Lord is saying, hey, you guys are known for your wisdom. Has wisdom gone away? One of the things, one of the ways that God brings judgment on a nation is a lack of wisdom. In, uh, in Isaiah, he says, I will give you an infant to lead you. I don't even care what side of the aisle you're on. Everybody's like, yep, we have children in charge. Right? It's like watching kindergarten, people yelling at each other, carrying on, the things that are happening in the streets, the riots, all the stuff that's going on, all the lawlessness in the land and in the nation. What does it look like? Childish fits, right? Just uh, what, what does the Lord say? I'll take wisdom from you. Where's your wisdom, Edom? You, you boasted in your wisdom, but is it gone? Part of the judgment through the foolish and childish leadership that comes into a lamb. 
He says in verse 8, flee, turn back, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan, for I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time when I will punish him. If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? If uh, thieves came by night, would they not destroy only enough for themselves? He's saying, look, when people go in and pick crops, there's always something left behind. Somebody can always walk in a field and find something left by the harvesters who have gone. But the Lord says, but I have stripped Esau bare. Uh, the Lord says, I'm taking it all. I'm not leaving anything behind. There's thieves when they break into your house, at least they leave garbage laying around, you know. I went to one guy's house one time that somebody had broke in and stole all his stuff. And it was amazing. I felt bad. I was like, would have been nice if they vacuumed or something. Because the only thing that was left was the debris of the rush of stealing every single thing he had. He says, the Lord says, look, the thieves, I'm going to be worse than that, he says. I have uncovered his hiding places. He will not be able to conceal himself. His children are destroyed. His brothers, his neighbors, he is no more. The, there's a play on words going on here in the original language because it is similar, Esau being stripped bare, to what happened to Esau when he sold his birthright and the way that he was upset about what had happened to him. Oh, he stole from me. Now, if you pay attention to the story, he gave it willingly. He wanted a bowl of stew. And he couldn't care less about the birthright. Oh, he wanted the stuff. But he couldn't care less about the birthright. He didn't care about any of that stuff. He didn't care about the seed of Messiah coming through. He didn't care about none of that. All he cared about was, I'm hungry. Now, later on, yeah, he complained. He complained. But the, we see here the Lord saying, I'm going to strip you, and it'll be like that. And he says now in verse 11, leave your fatherless children, and I will keep them alive, and your widows let them trust in me. So even in his destruction, he says, look, I, there will be the orphan and the widow, and I'll watch out for them. I'm going to watch out for those. For thus says the Lord, if those who did not deserve to drink the cup must drink it, will you go unpunished? You shall not go unpunished. You must drink. Remember what we read about in Jeremiah 25 when the Lord said to Jeremiah, hey, you got to tell the nations there's a cup of the indignation of God. Either you are going to run to Christ and he drank it for you. Let this cup pa pass from me, if there be any other way. Nevertheless, not my will, but yeah, your will be done. Jesus drank that cup. Yeah. The Lord says, there's a cup of indignation. And you make sure the nations know they all have to drink it. But there is redemption. There is one who drank it for us, right? The wrath of God was not the wrath of God poured out on the cross? That's the purpose, isn't it? That Christ would bear, he has bore our transgressions. And I was saying in Isaiah 53, he has borne our iniquity, the chastisement of us all, the beatings we should have got, he got. So the cup is going and you're, everybody's going to drink. And as far as I'm concerned, everybody has an opportunity to say, I, I, will, I will humbly bow before Christ who drank that cup for me. But there are others who in their pride will say, oh, no, I, I'm fine. I'll drink that cup. I've met people like that. When I stand before God, I'll tell him a thing or two. Okay. The Lord says, everyone's going to drink this cup. Nobody will escape from it. There will be no 
escape. You must drink, he says. For I have sworn by myself, declares the Lord, that Basra shall become a whore, a taunt, a waste, a curse, and her cities will be a perpetual waste. He says, Basra is going to be a horror. Basra is roughly halfway between Petra and the Dead Sea. Here's an interesting story. The prophets tell us that when Christ returns, he's going to come from Basra. He's going to come from Basra walking up the Jezreel Valley. You know where that passes through? A place just outside of a mountain called Megiddo. They call the valley under Megiddo Har Megiddo. Does that sound like something you've heard before? And they saw him and he said, they said to him, what is this all over you? And he says, oh, this is the blood of my enemies. For I have trampled the grapes of the wrath of God from Basra all the way up 185 miles up the Jezreel Valley. The picture, whether, whether it, it, it's literal or figurative, the point is the destruction of the wicked, right? The destruction of the wicked, judgment over the wicked, deliverance of the righteous. There's only one face, one name, one way that anyone escapes any of that. And that's through Jesus Christ. So here he's saying, he's laying out, look, I'm going to make Basra a waste. Basra is going to be a waste. The cities are all going to be gone. I have heard the message from the Lord and an envoy have been sent among the nations. So here, Jeremiah is saying, look, the Lord talked to me. He took the cup out of the Lord's hand, right? I'm going to make sure all the nations drink. He says, I take the message, and I sent an envoy to every nation, and I told them, gather yourselves together, come against her, rise for battle. For behold, I will make you small among the nations, despised among mankind. So the Edomites are thinking, hey, we got it together. Our life's pretty good. And Jeremiah says, man, I'm sending a message to all the other nations to go get you. God's hands are off. Go get them. Edom is all yours. You ever look at what it says that the, the, the book of Revelation tells about two incredible meals. You want to be at one of them. Right? Right? You are either going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, that's a good feast, or you will be at the feast of our great God. If you are at the feast of the great God, you are the meal for the birds. Because in Revelation, the Lord says, call every carnivorous bird to the plains and tell them to feast on the flesh of great men. Because on the day, the day of the Lord, when the destruction of the wicked happens, that's a bloody day. And the Lord declares multiple times in the prophets, I have no joy in the destruction of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn and live. You ever felt that way as a parent? I have no joy in the whooping of the kids. I don't want to do it. I would say to the boys, look, I don't want to do it. You don't want me to do it. What do you say we do something different today? But it's never different. 18 years, my oldest son would not get up in the morning. Ever. Did he ever get up in the morning, babe? Like babies don't count. This is how I would get woke up every day. This is what I get woke up by. Probably the fourth. Okay. Maybe I should say it. Anyways, I remember how all this angst would take place. 
morning time, time to get up, time to go do something, or bedtime, time to go to bed. And I, and I know that's just a small fraction of what it's like for God and the nations, right? And it's not, the Bible's very clear, it's not because the nations don't believe there's a God. I don't care what somebody tells you. Every, every, every especially today, I have heard the craziest things. I'm not going to talk about that either. <laughs> I have heard, but today I heard crazy things about people, what people say, you know. And we all have heard it before, right? I've just, from now on, I am whatever. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I should not. Lord, help me. Just hold my tongue. I don't want to read the emails later. The, the, so anyways, people make crazy claims. And just because someone says, I don't believe in God, doesn't mean you have to believe that. People nowadays say all kind of stuff. Just because they say it doesn't make it true, right? The Bible says, they know I'm here. Romans 1, read it. Romans 1 said, all man's guilty before God because they know God, because God showed himself to them. Clearly seen through the things he has made. So that they are, what's the next phrase? Without excuse. That's not what it's, this, it, it's not that. It's that man knows God, knows there is a God, but refuses to come. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. He said to the Pharisees in John chapter 5, you refuse to come to me that you could have life. You could live, but you won't come to me. Judgment will come. The Bible is full of that concept. There will be judgment. It's appointed unto man. Once to die and then judgment. That's what, this is what that verse means. As sure as death is judgment. Right? As sure as death, how many people die? Okay, everybody. <laughs> right? Well, okay, I'll, I'll grant you that if the Lord comes back, there will be some who don't have to die. But that's not the point. The point is, unless the Lord comes, we're all going to one day, right? As sure as death, we will also be judged. Now, I choose to have my judgment under Christ. That's, man is, man is free. Jesus said, repent and believe. Cast your cares on me, for I care for you. Call upon my name. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be. So the idea is we can either do that or we can say, nope. And I will face that judgment. So the judgment of the nations, the Lord says, look, this is coming. This is coming. Gather yourselves together. Here comes the battle. There will be nowhere to hide. Verse 16, the horror... You inspire has deceived you in the pride of your heart, you who live in the clefts of the rock, who hold to the height of the hill. Though you make your nest as high as the eagles, I will bring you down from there, declares the Lord. Doesn't matter where you go. Doesn't matter how you think you'll be delivered or what argument you think you have. There is nothing that will deliver you from before the Lord. Edom shall become a horror. Everyone who passes by will be horrified. They'll hiss because of its disasters. As when Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities were overthrown, says the Lord, no man will dwell there, no man shall sojourn in her. So the Lord's talking to Edom about total destruction. Behold, like a lion coming from the jungle of Jordan against a perennial pasture, I will suddenly make him run away from her. I will appoint over her whomever I choose, for who is like me? Who can summon me? What shepherd could stand before me? Therefore, hear the plan that the Lord has made against Edom and the purposes that he has formed against the inhabitants of Timon. Even the little ones of the flock will be drug away. Surely their fold will be appalled at their fate and at the sound of their fall, the earth will tremble. The sound of their cry will be heard at the Red Sea. 
Behold, one shall mount up and fly swiftly like an eagle, spread its wings against Basra, the heart of the warriors of Edom, shall on that day be like the heart of a woman in birth pains. So when God talks about Edom, total destruction, and not a promise of a restoration of Edom. Now he goes on to talk about Damascus. <clears throat> Concerning Damascus, Hamath and Arpad are confounded for they have heard bad news. They melt in fear. They are troubled like the sea that cannot be quiet. Damascus has become feeble. She turned to flee and panic seized her. Anguish and sorrows have taken a hold of her like a woman in labor. It's a common theme, right? When God talks about judgment of nations, he talks about labor pains, right? As soon as labor pains come, you know there's going to be a baby. That's the point. As soon as labor pains come, you know that it's going to come to culmination. And so this judgment that is coming upon Damascus, just as Edom before them, <coughs> is going to fall. How is the famous city not forsaken, the city of my joy? Therefore, her young men will fall in her squares, and all her soldiers shall be destroyed in that day, declares the Lord of hosts. And I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it will devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadad. So, the fall of Damascus, which, by the way, is the oldest city in the world. So if you get a chance to go visit Damascus, uh, there is, if you stand in Damascus and look toward Israel, you're looking toward Abraham's gate, the oldest, as far as I know, the oldest archaeological find that we have in existence is the mud gate that Abraham walked through on the way to Damascus. The next section is to the Bedouins, the nomadic tribes around Israel. He says, now concerning Kedar and the kingdoms of Hazor, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, struck down. Thus says the Lord, rise up, advance against Kedar, destroy the people of the east. Their tents and their flocks shall be taken. Their curtains and all their goods, their camels, shall be led away from them, and men shall cry to them, terror on every side. So we have this idea that nomadic peoples would say, well, the problem is all you city folk. That's judgment going to come on all you city folk, but us, us folk out here in the middle of nowhere, we're good. We're, that judgment is not coming for us. Here's the one thing we know about men. All men are wicked. Now, when I say men, I mean mankind, ladies, just in case you were thinking, amen, brother, they're all wicked. We, <laughs> we are all wicked. That's what the Bible declares. Where you live, doesn't matter. God's judgment will come upon all. He says, flee, wander away, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Hazor, declares the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has a plan against you and formed a purpose against you. Rise up, advance against the nation at ease. So they have it easy, right? They don't get involved in all the other stuff going on in the world. They're just, you know... We're just nomads. No pass. It is appointed unto man once to die and then. And all men apart from the Messiah, all men apart from faith in Christ, will face that judgment without the covering of the blood of Christ. That is a bad day. So these people, they live without a care, Listen, it says uh, um, that arise up against the city that has no gates or bars. They dwell alone. That's because they're in tents, right? Their camels will become plunder, their herds and livestock a spoil. And I will scatter to every wind those who cut the corners of their hair. I will bring their calamity from every side because they have no walled cities. I will bring calamity from every side, declares the Lord. Hazor will become a haunt of jackals. An everlasting waste, no man will dwell there, no man shall sojourn in her. Ultimately, they're spoiled by Babylon. And the point of it all is that that judgment that falls, it falls whether you're in that 
you know, we all like to say, we all like to point the finger at somewhere else, right? Las Vegas is Sin City, not Buell. Because there's got to be more sin happening there than here, right? I don't, I don't know if that works. Uh, every person will be guilty, right? So we have this, this ideal he's laying out. Now we have the last judgment that we have tonight, Elam. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam. Uh, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. So this is earlier. This was something that came earlier about Elam. Now Elam's the furthest away that Jeremiah ever prophesies against. They're 200 miles east of Babylon. So they're, they're pretty far out of the normal arc that, uh, that judgment comes on. But in Isaiah 22.6, the Elamite archers were part of the conquest of Israel. In uh, Isaiah 22, 6, it says, And Elam bore the quiver with chariots and horsemen. So they were a part of what was going on <clears throat> in the <clears throat> captivity and destruction of Israel. And uh, so God has them entered into the, uh, to the role. So the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet during the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, they're famous for archery, the mainstay of their might. And I will bring upon Elam the four winds from the four quarters of heaven. Revelation talks about that. And I will scatter them to all those winds. And there shall be no nation to which those driven out of Elam shall not come. So they're going to be scattered everywhere. I will terrify Elam before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them. My fierce anger, declares the Lord. I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them, and I will set my throne in Elam. Destroy their king and their officials, declares the Lord. He lays out this judgment, but it doesn't stop there. What's it say in verse 39? But in the latter days, I will restore the fortunes of Elam. Now, you notice if you go through the oracle of the nations, there are some nations the Lord says, I'm going to restore you. And there are some nations the Lord says, I'm going to utterly <laughs> blot you out. So we see that exactly what God said in Genesis is true. He says, I will not always strive with man. And God as king has the right to say, that's all the chances you get, right? That's the end. Whenever I, I read these sections and I think about it, I think about, you know, I just want to bring application toward us and say, okay, well, you know, are we, are we living in all that the Lord has for us today? Are we occupying what God has for us? Are we fulfilling that purpose that God has. We run into those people, right, that we have had reject the word over and over and over again and always with the prayer when I share with them is, I hope that's not the last time. Maybe one more time. And we always think we'll have a, an argument that will convince them. <laughs> I don't know if it works like that. I think, I think sometimes it works like a, a, sometimes a man's got to get to the point where he's willing to bow the knee. I've known personally some men who had to be hit with big sticks to get on a knee and say, you know what, Lord, I have been rebelling against you my whole life, and I quit. I'm done. I don't want to rebel no more. I want what you have, because judgment day will come, and God will judge the living and the dead. There is one name under heaven by which men must be saved, right? And that is Jesus. Amen. Why don't you guys stand with us? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time. We can come before you, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that we can have, Lord, to uh, just sing praises to your name, to glorify who you are, God, and what you have done for us. Lord, I'm so thankful that you made a way, 
God, I am so thankful for the story that I read through Scripture, God, about how you have accomplished a perfect salvation, Lord. That you have brought us to a place that we can happily and joyfully enter into all that you have for us. God, I pray that you would be just glorified and magnified as we put our hope and our trust in you and know that you, God, are beautiful beyond expectation, comprehension. God, that we can see oh, just the, the beauty of the sacrifice that you lay out before us. So, Lord, be glorified as we who believe will reach out and we pray that you would grant repentance and an open heart and mind to those who will hear the words of our cry calling men to repent and believe. I pray that you give us endurance to continue the job until we see your face. And I pray in and through it all, Lord, you be glorified and magnified as we ultimately just seek your blessing your anointing, your special touch in and through it all, that you would receive all the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.